Hello, everyone. Welcome to week two of Virtual Waste Workshop. Um, we are here with the second session of Subglacial Environments, Processes, and Life Forms. Today, we'll hear from TJ, Eliza, Ben, Paul, and Andrew with their talks that are listed on the screen here. Um, just in case anyone in attendance isn't familiar with how this has been working, we'll give eight minute talks with a minute or two for questions as we transfer to the next speaker. Please feel free to use the chat function in Zoom. Um, we can continue discussing talks throughout the whole session and then there will be a discussion period following Andrew's talk at the end of the session. Um, as long as there are no questions, I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll let CJ take it away. Should I start sharing my screen? Yes. Um, probably wrong screen, isn't it? Yeah. Um, try that again. Okay, does that does that look? Yep, that's perfect. Okay, great. So um, um, I'm TJ Young. I'm a postdoc at the uh, University of Cambridge Scott Polar Research Institute uh, with the ITGC time team. And uh, today I'd like to share some of the research that we're doing in quantifying kind of ice fabric and anisotropy at shear margin, specifically the Thwaites Eastern shear margin. Um, and I'm presenting on behalf of uh, Dusty Paul Slavic and um, the um, larger ITGC time team. Cool. So um, just a bit of the background. Um, what are shear margins? And so I guess the best way to describe shear margins are kind of for those who don't know, are bands of intense shearing that kind of delineate ice that's not moving from ice that is moving. So basically it bounds glacier, glaciers from, and ice streams from stagnant ice. Um, specifically, um, the shear margins are usually bounded either topographically, so by kind of a drop in bed topography or by other basal um, features such as um, slip, uh, basal slip, uh, presence of water, et cetera. If we look at Thwaites Glacier, we can see that um, all but the eastern shear margin is bounded by topography. And so we can establish that the eastern shear margin has weak basal control and is more susceptible to migration than the other um, shear margins. Um, and uh, if we look at the radiograms that cross the eastern shear margin, um, these radiograms show kind of periodic interference patterns in the received power. Um, they're not restricted to these radiograms. They, you can, for anyone who's worked with um, airborne radiograms, you probably would have seen these um, types of interference patterns before as well. Um, specifically in the radiograms that we investigate. So the radiograms from the uh, accumulation radar from Croesus that cross the shear margin. Um, we see them rise and dip as they approach and leave the shear margin center. And um, our, for this presentation, uh, I'd like to present kind of an argument that um, claims these interference patterns to be a result from birefringence. Um, and so for those who do not know what birefringence is, it is the result of radar waves traveling through ice where the radar waves, which are um, split into two orthogonal waves, travel in two different, slightly different speeds due to differences in relative permittivity. And so the differences, the slight differences in those speeds create this interference pattern that you see. Um, if we assume that these um, patterns should be a result of birefringence, then we can link Biofringence to fabric strength and fabric asymmetry using um, kind of polarimetric backscatter models based on previous papers listed in the 
further reading. Um, and I think I'll try and skip through a lot of the maths. Um, but basically, what we're, what we're arguing is that if the, um, if we assume um, birefringence, then we can calculate from the models birefringence by looking at um, changing the um, input fabric parameters, um, specifically the di difference between E2, um, E2 and E1. So the eigenvectors um, 2 and 1 for those who've calculated fabric before. And so we can, from the models, we determine the fabric to be a um, inversely proportional and exponentially inversely proportional to the, uh, the periodicity, so the distance between the um, layers. So basically what I'm trying to say is um, the larger the distance between two consecutive layers, the, the weaker the fabric is, and thus the more isotropic the fabric is, and the reverse would be true. So the closer the layers are spaced together, the more anisotropic the layers are, and thus the stronger the fabric is. And so if we analyze the, um, if we kind of automate the analysis for um, the interference patterns that we see across the shear margin, you can see that um, the layers kind of rise up um, in depth towards shear margin, peaking at the um, peaking at the point of maximum shear, and then they drop back down um, into the inside of shear margin. So um, drop back down right here, and you can see that the fabric is weaker on the outside of the shear margin. So right here. And then the fabric is strongest at the shear margin right here. And then the fabric is probably somewhere in between inside of the shear margin. And so this is one of six transects. And I'm going to quickly scroll through each of the, the rest of the six transects to show you that it's about the same. So you can see the similar patterns in the, each of the six transects. And so if we collate all of the six transects together, you can see that the shear margin um, as defined by these birefringence layers, um, show kind of an anticlinal morphology. So this a uh, hump in the morphology of the layers, at, with it being centered at the shear margin boundaries. And you can also see that the fabric strength for all of the layers is strongest at the shear margin center, with um, a fabric being weaker um, on the outside of shear margin center. On the, uh, on the outside of the shear margin, so negative, shear, uh, negative distances and stronger but also more variable inside the shear margin. Um, if you kind of um, analyze the results in terms of comparing the change in uh, the, the slopes of the birefringence layers with the um, changes in fabric strength through distance, you can see a um, positive cor correlation, which shows that rising slopes are correlated with an increase in fabric strength and dipping slopes are correlated with a decrease in fabric strength. Um, just to quickly um, summarize what we know about fabric and shear margins, um, to, to summarize, we don't know a lot because most of the results that we have are from theory and lab, lab analyses. But from these analyses, we can assume the um, crystal, or in fabri crystal orientation fabric to be a horizontal pole because um, due to the uh, combination of compressive forces and um, pure shear. Um, I think because, um, because there's, you can go way into depth about fabric and it's pretty difficult to summarize fabric in eight minutes. I've listed further reading for those who want to look at that further. But basically, um, given our results, which show that we can swim th this hump, this anticlinal morphology, combined with um, the uh, increase in fabric asymmetry, um, that shows that this, um, this hump, this anticlinal anticlinal morphology can be representative of um, the location of shear margins. And we see this hump 
at other places, for example, here, that is not correlated with the present location of maximum shear. Um, there's a possibility that um, the location of the anticline away from maximum shear could be a remnant of past shear margin fabric. So that is something that is interesting um, just to look at further and um, we will do so. Um, I think just to quickly mention the uh, limitation, the limitations of our research. Um, we, all, we look at bioprevention layers that, are, that we have delineated, but um, obviously um, there are many regions of the ice sheet kind of in depth and across different places on the ice sheet that do not show these layers. So what causes these layers to appear and disappear? And if we do not observe any layers, does that mean that they do not exist? So basically, um, the presence and absence of bioprevention layers shows the presence of um, azimuthally symmetric fabric or azimuthally asymmetric fabric. And so um, if the fabric is kind of azimuthally asymmetric, uh, symmetric, then you may or may not be able to detect, detect it by radar. So basically, what we're saying is, um, if the layers are not there, it doesn't mean that there's no anisotropy present. But if there, it, if we detect layers there, then it means that we do detect changes in anisotropy through the changes in bioprevention layer morphology. Um, and so, kind of to summarize what we've seen in this analysis. Um, we can see that the wavelength of interference patterns in radiograms um, indicate changes in fabric strength through looking at the rising and dipping of the um, bioprevention layers relative to each other. And so we observe through these the, the morpho morphology um, an anticline at centered at the peak of um, shear margin, uh, peak of sh shear strain. Um, that also corresponds in a peak with fabric asymmetry, which shows that fabric becomes more anisotropic at the shear margin. And um, lastly, a uh, higher absor observed anisotropy at the shear margin center support supports fabric de development that enhances kind of streaming flow. Um, you can see the future directions on the other side that we would probably want to investigate further. So combining observations with modeling, um, looking at um, other data sets it, that were measured in the same study areas using different types of radar and seismic experiments to see if you can kind of um, con contextualize the results and kind of beef up the results with other observations. And lastly, to use kind of the um, identification of the anticlinal morphology to identify potential shear margin fabric in other ice streams and to potentially identify other indications of ice, um, shear margin migration. Um, I think that should be it. Thank you very much. Thank you, TJ. Um, while we're switching over to the next talk by Eliza, um, if anyone has a question, just go ahead and type it in the chat so we can keep the conversation going. All right, I'll go ahead and get started then. Um, I'm Eliza. I am a graduate student at Stanford University. I work with Dusty Schroeder. Um, and I, this work that I'm presenting, I'm also uh, in collaboration with Winnie Chu, Eliza Mentelli, and Helen Sorosi. So here is a map that I made of modeled basal temperatures for Antarctica. And these temperatures at the ice bed interface are very heterogeneous. Red here shows regions where the ice bed interface is at the pressure melting point. 
And the range in dark blues to gray take you from very frozen up to just below thawing. It's interesting to compare this map of basal temperatures to that of surface velocities. Notice how um, these flowing, fast flowing glaciers that you can see uh, in like ice streams um, and fast flowing glaciers have thawed beds, but very close to them, you can see um, some much colder regions where the ice at the base is below the pressure melting point. So you can kind of get this picture of thawed beds under fast flowing regions and then much colder temperatures in some so slow flowing interior regions um, like the Transantarctic Mountains, for example. But what I think is particularly interesting are these regions where the bed is just below the pressure melting point. So these are these gray and light pink areas. So now here, um, the regions that are, I've kind of circled some of the regions that are just below the pressure melting point. And the question is, how could the ice sheet evolve if these frozen patches where the ice bed interface is just below the melting point transition to being thawed? So basically, how could a change in the basal thermal state act as a forcing on the ice sheet's evolution? Those are the types of questions that I'm trying to get at. And in this presentation, I'm going to show that thawing these regions can actually drive mass loss continent-wide. So let's dive into my model setup and experiments now. I'm using ISSM. Um, which is a three-dimensional thermomechanical large-scale ice sheet model. And I'm doing continent-wide simulations, not just of West Antarctica. Um, my horizontal resolution ranges from three kilometers along the coast to 30 kilometers inland. And I have five vertical layers with quadratic interpolation between them. And I'm using the higher order ice flow approximation. So here are thawed, you know, and frozen bed regions of Antarctica. This is plotted with these masks here. The friction coefficient is different for these zones. So here I plotted the distribution of friction coefficient um, for some of the different drainage basins. And what you can see is that the friction coefficient is higher in frozen bed regions and lower in thawed bed regions. So now I'm showing a mask of areas within 100 kilometers of the coast. Um, the blue is showing regions where the bed is very frozen. Red is regions at, where the bed is at the pressure melting point. And gray are these regions which I'm calling thawable. So these are the regions that are just below the pressure melting point, could be susceptible thawing. These are often regions that are close to fast flowing glaciers. So it is interesting because you, know, you could imagine that glaciers uh, could change over time. These regions are, are nearby to them. And um, given that the friction coefficient is, uh, values are, um, are lower in the fast flowing regions than in frozen regions, I'm now using the friction coefficient as a proxy for thaw. So in this uh, animation here, what you can see is for the first 100 years of my simulation, I'm using my model inferred friction coefficient. And then starting at 100 years, I've reduced the friction coefficient in any region in this simulation that's within three degrees of the pressure melting point. Um, and I've done a bunch of simulations, not just regions that are within three degrees below the pressure melting point, um, but ranges from anywhere within one degree up to 10 degrees. But this is the idea. So you can kind of see that once you hit 100 years, um, some regions, the friction coefficient is decreasing in. So now, if you allow this to continue to run with uh, this change in friction coefficient over time, what you can see is that um, mass loss will, will then start to um, 
the, the rate of mass loss will basically increase the larger the thawable region is. So for example, the last one, um, you can look at a range from, you know, thawing anywhere from regions within one degree up to regions within anywhere where the bed is within 10 degrees of thaw. And you can see that the rate of mass loss also increases with that. So it depends on the extent of thaw. Um, um, and then the magnitude is also comparable to current observations. So I think that this is really interesting because it shows that just by, you know, changing the, modifying the friction coefficient and thereby, you know, examining how the ice sheet could respond to thawing at the ice bed interface, we're getting a significant amount of mass loss. And this is comparable with observations that we're getting or I should say with, with like observations, you know, uh, over the last like 40 years. Um, so, so now kind of transitioning to next steps, um, I'm interested in continuing to look at uh, kind of the ice sheet sensitivity to thaw. So it's interesting that in initial results kind of show a nonlinear relationship between the extent of thaw and mass loss. So the, this top figure here, you're looking again at the, the size of the thawable zone. So basically, if you have a larger thawable definition of maybe everywhere within 10 degrees C, that uh, you're going to get some amount of mass loss. But you know, if your thawable definition is everywhere within one degree uh, below the pressure melting point, you get different mass loss. Um, that relationship between them doesn't appear to be linear. So that could suggest that there could be certain temperature thresholds in this change that I am in the process of investigating this more. Um, and then also, if you look uh, on more of regional scale, I'm curious to see what regions could be use, losing mass the quickest and uh, kind of start to get an idea of maybe there's some sort of regional progression in in um, you know, vulnerability in different regions. So we, you might see that it takes only a small amount of thawing to produce mass loss in certain catchments, um, and that's kind of the next step. So I will be presenting this work and some of these next steps at AGU if you're curious to continue to follow along. And um, yeah, thank you. Elijah, that was great. If anyone has a question, we have uh, about a minute for asking that while we switch over to our next speaker, Ben Hills. Yeah, I had a quick question. Uh, Liza, which uh, basal friction law did you use in ISSM? I'm, I'm using the Wirtman friction law right now, so there's no effective pressure dependence. Awesome. That was my exact question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I am curious to maybe try some others, but for now I'm using uh, that law and, and maybe looking at kind of how it changes to other laws um, down the line too. So I think it's an interesting component. Yeah, it's very cool. I know they have a thin water layer one, and I guess I was wondering if you would touch that at all since you're considering frozen versus thawed, but we, yeah. we can chat. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, if anyone else has questions for Eliza, please ask them in the chat to keep the conversation going. Go ahead, Ben. Okay, thanks all for coming, especially those West Coasters who woke up early this morning. Uh, my name is Ben, for those of you who I haven't met. I'm a PhD student at University of Washington working with Christensen, and today I'm gonna to be talking about ice temperature at the South Pole. Okay, so to start, I wanna just um, discuss why we even care about ice temperature. And when most glaciologists are asked that question, they would respond with uh, its control on the ice viscosity and rightfully so, or uh, an alternative would be, as we saw in Eliza's talk, uh, its control on sliding uh, in places where we have a temperate bed. But uh, in terms of the viscosity over the range of temperatures that we observe in Earth's ice sheets, the viscosity ranges by about four orders of magnitude. Now, an alternative reason why you might care, which is perhaps discussed less and what I'm gonna focus on a bit more today is uh, kind of the slow rate of diffusion. And what that means is that 
thermal deviations can kind of be locked into the ice sheet for long periods of time. And we've seen this with uh, borehole thermometry where we can infer paleoclimate uh, changes. But today I'm gonna use that to uh, kind of discuss changes in ice dynamics. So the measured temperatures that I am going to use today were from uh, the South Pole from the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory. And when they installed that observatory, they uh, made some ice temperature measurements down to about 500 meters above the bed. So that's uh, these dots or these um, pluses here. Uh, and what's interesting is that those deepest measurements are quite cold, so about minus 20 degrees Celsius. And that contradicts the geophysical measurements, some airborne radar nearby that shows a subglacial lake, the South Pole Lake, about 15 kilometers away. So on the one side, we have cold, deep ice. And on the other side, we know that there should be a thawed bed. Now, the working hypothesis for uh, to explain this is that there was once, maybe 20,000 years ago, an upstream extension of the support force ice stream, and that that added some frictional heating, melted out this lake, and that somewhere around 15,000 years ago, that ice stream, or that at least the, the tributary of that ice stream shut down, and since then, the ice has started cooling down, and the lake is, uh, is freezing today. Now, today I'm gonna kind of explore that hypothesis uh, in two different parts. The first part is a geophysical survey that we did to kind of investigate this lake. And then the second part, I'll do uh, a bit of simple modeling. Uh, now in this first section, the geophysical survey, I'm gonna present three observations, each of which isn't entirely conclusive on its own, but together, taken together, they point towards a thawed bed today around the lake. Uh, so the first observation is the lake geometry. And what we did is drive kinematic GPS to constrain the surface elevation, which is this plot on the top, and then deep sounding radar to constrain the bed elevation. And uh, taking those two components together, we can map out the hydropotential, which is this here. And we see a hydropotential basin outlined in this white contour. And I chose that specific level based on uh, the lake depth of the observed from seismics. Now, the important observation to, make, to take from this is that the lake likely drains to the grid southwest here, and that the lake is almost uh, entirely full. So, uh, so there's not a lot of room for the lake to be any more full or else it would be draining to the southwest. So uh, my observation here is that there couldn't have been much freezing in, the, in that time since the hypothetical shutdown of the ice stream tributary. The second observation is a reflectivities uh, that we observe from the deep radar. And these are uh, pretty much uniform. So what we can see in the histograms on the left, these are all the bed picks from the entire survey that we did. And then these are those inside the lake outline uh, that we drew. And what you would expect from a transition uh, uh, from uh, liquid water versus that of a frozen bed is something like a 20 dB offset. And we really don't see that to put these observations into context, I am plotting here just a figure from Roger Koble's ITACE 2 paper, where we can see that this is this is the ITACE 2 traverse here, these uh, dots, and these are the reflectivity measurements. It's quite dim kind of all along the traverse until they're coming into the South Pole sector where it's it brightens up a bit. So this suggests that there's some kind of uniformly bright area in, in this region. The third observation is a bit more complicated and sadly I don't have a ton of time to explain it all, but essentially we made some dynamic, uh, some observations of the ice dynamics, uh, both uh, 50 velocity measurements at the surface, as well as we have 10 uh, AP res locations. And I used the, the surface velocity measurements to kind of constrain the, the surface strain rates, and that's plotted here in the right. Uh, this is another map with the lake outline here, and I just chose one APRES location and constrained the strain rates around that. So we can see with ice flowing to the um, up and to the left, we have longitudinal extension, which is these blue lines all around this, uh, this one APRES. And I, like, again, I just chose this one site for the sake of this talk. And then we have a cross flow compression. I want to compare that to the vertical strain rates constrained by AP res, and that's here on the, the right panel. And 
you can see that the measurement is these dots and we don't have good coherency below about 1800 meters or so. So that's why the dots are uh, vacant below that. But I want to compare the surface strain rates to the vertical strain rates. And what I did was just kind of fit a line that uh, tried to bring those two into balance. Uh, and what that shows, that's this line here this is the best fit. And it shows that they're quite out of balance and that it wants to be a higher uh, vertical strain rate. And my interpretation of that is that there's been some change in the dynamics recently, some change in sliding hypothetically uh, that led to that uh, out of balance state. Okay, so those are the three observations, each of which are kind of pointing to, you know, perhaps increased sliding, uniformly bright bed, and uh, a full lake point to um, perhaps a, a wet bed and distributed around the lake. So now I'm going to go into the temperature analysis. So the previous modeling that had been done around here was kind of showed that uh, the deep cold ice and a temperate bed are um, inconsistent with any steady state model. So I took uh, some of the data from the payload climate data from South Pole Ice Core and used that to constrain a time dependent model. Here we have surface temperature and accumulation rate through time back to uh, the EMEAN and that was extended back using Epicodome C Ice Core. And then uh, the bottom is my guess at the, at the sliding, so heat production by sliding. And what we see, this is this first hypothesis, the freezing hypothesis that is um, in the literature today, where we have active sliding until about 15,000 years ago, and then that shuts off. And on the right, we have the temperature results with the dots being the measured temperatures, and then two lines for the model temperatures, one directly above the lake that's held to the pressure melting point at the bed, and then one nearby in this hypothesis could cool down because you have freezing. Uh, and the nearby would be closer to the actual measurements that weren't directly on top of the lake. Now I take that model and these are uh, results from an optimization where I'm essentially trying to optimize the, the sliding source. Uh, and this is the objective function of that optimization here. So on the x-axis we have a change in sliding speed with negative being uh, kind of a shutdown, a slowdown uh, in sliding and then positive being a speed up. Uh, and in the case where we have a slowdown, the timing of that change wants to be, you know, 15,000 years ago or earlier. And uh, that would be the, the first hypothesis, the freezing hypothesis that we just explored. Now, this objective function points out that there's also an alternative hypothesis, which is speed up, but much more recently. Uh, so essentially, the idea is that you have some thickening of the ice sheet in this region that warms up the bed and then you activate sliding and that start, that uh, kind of initiates melting. So this is the alternative hypothesis here uh, where you have kind of no sliding until very recently into the Holocene and at the last second um, these temperatures remain cold because the diffusion length scale is really slow so it takes a long time to warm up from the bed but that we can get melting kind of uh, in the last few thousand years. So that's where I'll leave it. There's kind of these two thermodynamically plausible scenarios, but uh, our geophysical survey actually points to the latter that I presented. So towards this kind of speed up and melting to the Holocene. Now, I just want to kind of leave you guys with one point that maybe we can carry into the discussion uh, that I didn't have time to get into, but that um, the seismic survey from this lake shows that there's a 100 meter sediment column underlying the lake and that this makes the, the lake a possible drilling target for, uh, for future campaigns. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, that was great. I have a million questions for you about those um, lake sediments that all hold for the discussion period. Um, all right. Next up, we have Paul Summers telling us more about Thwaites Glacier. Cool. So I think everyone should see my correct screen now. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so my name is Paul Summers. I'm a PhD student at Stanford University working with uh, Jenny Sukali and also a part of ITGC and the TIME team. And I'll be presenting our work today, uh, Investigating Mechanisms of Basal Strength at Thwaites Glacier. Um, so as we all know, and uh, Liza actually presented on today, that there are a number of uh, large-scale 
ISO models that, sorry, I got to move everybody around here, covering my notes. Here we go. There are a number, number of sophisticated large scale ice flow models that are used to project the future evolution of ice sheets and glaciers. Um, these include complex physics and uh, couplings at the uh, ocean and atmosphere, atmospheric interfaces. Um, but one assumption that a lot of these models make um, is including static basal friction parameters that are initialized via an inversion at the beginning of the run and then held constant through time. Um, that's not always the case, as Eliza pointed out, but it is a common assumption that is made. And one drawback to this assumption is that it largely fixes the lateral geometry of ice glaciers or of glaciers and uh, limits their ability to interact with potentially changing uh, basal friction distributions. And we do know that basal friction can change. Uh, a notable example of this is at, on the Seipel Coast where the Cam ice stream underwent a large migration of its uh, shear margin, moving tens of kilometers over a very brief period and then followed thereafter by a complete shutdown of the entire stream. <clears throat> um, it's believed that this was caused by a change in uh, basal strength driven by changes in hydrology at the bed, um, with water piracy being routed elsewhere and ceasing to lubricate the bed. Um, and I think as an example, this is a good motivator to point to that understanding the physical mechanisms of strength within a glacial basin is critical to understanding the time scales over which the basal strength in that region may potentially change. And so when we look to apply this to uh, Thwaites, we'll propose uh, four process-based formulations of basal strength within the basin. Um, we'll then use a, a depth integrated fee boundary uh, thermomechanically coupled model to simulate the uh, ice flow that would result from such a basal strength distribution. Um, I won't get into the model today, but it's uh, developed after uh, Schuf and Meyer. Um, and then we will use bed machine for realistic topography in both the ice flow model and for our uh, distributions of basal strength that we'll run through now. And so the first case of basal strength um, is a theory of overburden. So this assumes that the bed is roughly of uniform composition and constant water pressure, and that the strength of the bed is determined solely by the weight of the overlying ice. Um, and we can see that as an input to this, uh, we use the surface DEM of the ice surface um, and bed uh, depth estimates from radar. That produces the strength distribution shown here on the right, whereas we move inland in our domain, we see significant strengthening underneath the thicker ice. Um, the second case that we'll consider is that of bed composition, where changes in strength are determined by uh, the distribution of weak sediments within the basin. Um, and we assume that these soft pliable sediments will accumulate in lower regions of the bed and that higher regions are more likely to have either thinner till or have uh, exposed sections of bedrock that offer more resistance to flow and a higher basal strength. That produces the profile shown here on the right, where we can see as we move inland, we see significant weakening as the bed gets deeper, owing to the reverse sloping bed in the Thwaites Basin. And another feature to point out is in the center of our domain, we see um, a shallow valley that's accumulated more weak till, um, and is a area of weakness in the center of our domain that will promote uh, rapid sliding in some of our model runs. Uh, as we move towards cases three and four, which will be attempts to characterize the hydraulic uh, behavior of the area, we'll need some more observations um, from the field. And so we'll use specularity results from radar, which gives us some insight into the nature of the hydraulic system beneath uh, the glacier. And so um, these observations indicate that upstream at Thwaites, we expect to find a, a high pressure distributed water system um, that will uh, weaken the bed due to the high water pressures there. And as we move towards the coast downstream, uh, we'll, that hydraulic system will transition into a more centralized, efficient drainage system characterized by low pressure and high basal strengths. So motivated by that transition, um, we build a model that uses hydraulic uh, potential as a proxy for bed strength. And we assign regions of high hydraulic potential to low basal strength. Um, assuming that those regions will be a more distributed high pressure uh, water system. And as we move towards the coast, um, a lower uh, re in, and regions of lower hydraulic potential, we are uh, modeling a transition to a more centralized and efficient drainage system with lower water pressure and higher basal strengths. And then to build our case four, we add two additional large scale hydraulic features to that same model. And so we add the impacts of uh, meltwater, regional meltwater channels, 
which are large scale and promote strengthening of the bed in the immediate vicinity as they efficiently drain water out of those regions. And we add the impact of four subglacial lakes, which have zero basal strength as the ice water interface offers no resistance to sliding. And so when we run these four models through, uh, four models of basal strength through our ice flow model, we get the um, results shown here on the bottom in log 10 speed. And we can compare those to surface observations from 2017 on the left. Um, and I've annotated the uh, field observations with a black line where we observe shear margins and highlighted the central trunk in light gray. Um, the initial takeaway for case one, that of overburden, is that this does not match observations very well. Uh, this lines up well with our intuition that the um, distribution of basal strength weights is largely driven by processes at the bed and not by just the weight of the ice column alone. Um, and then we, when we look to bed composition, case two, we see that um, the central trunk of flow is reproduced, that we do see a continuous band of rapid sliding in the center of our domain, and that this lines up quite well with that um, shallow valley that we mentioned before, the area of weakness. And then we see quite strong shear margins in that model um, that again correspond with the edges of that narrow valley, but that doesn't line up well with the more widespread sliding that we observe at Thwaites today. Um, in contrast to that, our cases of hydrology um, have quite diffuse shear margins that actually don't even fully arrest flow by the edge of our domain, um, but they do produce the central trunk of flow and more widespread sliding, um, as is a little more consistent with what we actually observe at Thwaites today. Um, a note to that is that in the case of uh, hydrology where we've added lakes and channels, we do see a slightly more distinct shear margin, particularly on the sort of northeast side, um, owing to the additional strengthening that these channels have allowed for. And so in conclusion, um, it seems like va variations in bed composition and basal water pressure likely work together to contribute to basal strength at Thwaites Glacier. Um, the role of hydrology is particularly noteworthy given the potential for rapid rearrangement of hydraulically controlled systems. And so that sort of brings up the next steps where we'll be looking more into how the role of hydrology um, plays a role at Thwaites Glacier, especially in the future as it may come to change, um, given that hydraulic systems can rearrange themselves somewhat rapidly on the time scale of glaciers. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. That was great. Um, we will move on to our last talk by Andrew Hoffman. If anyone has questions as we transition, feel free to ask them. Okay, we're good to go, Andrew. All right, I'd like to thank the session conveners um, and also my co-authors. I am Andrew Hoffman. I work at the University of Washington with Knut Christensen, Nicole Shu, Ian Jock, and Daniel Shapiro and Ben Smith. Um, and I'm interested in questions um, that pertain to kind of the controls of sliding beneath Thwaites Glacier. At right is a time series from uh, Cryosat 2 swath processed altimetry that show um, an inland thinning signal from Thwaites driven by um, submarine melt. Uh, and then um, a system of lakes on Thwaites that drain. And so I'm gonna use these observations along with um, snapshot inversions for the um, basal resistance field beneath Thwaites to try and understand um, the controls on sliding. Um, so this is again, just an outline. Um, the results that I find is that inland basal resistance beneath Thwaites is currently controlled by static bed properties, not the transient subglacial hydrology system. Um, and then that the static bed properties um, represent a convolution of form drag um, and skin drag that we can deconvolve with um, inversions that use high resolution. This is an overview of Thwaites Glacier, um, the system of lakes that Ben Smith identified in 2017 that drain in 2012, um, drain again in 2017. These are the Thwaites 124, Thwaites 142, and Thwaites 170. There are also two more systems of lakes on Thwaites that drain. These are in the Haynes Glacier shear margin um, and then um, the western tributary of Thwaites. Um, 
at left are um, the positions of GPS, which I use to understand the velocity signal associated with the elevation change or volume change of these lakes. Um, so in blue here are the volume changes of the lakes. Um, they drain in 2012, as Ben Smith first noted. Um, this is, uh, uh, happens at the same time as a, a, a small speed up that we observe at the lower Thwaites site, which is right next to the largest Thwaites lake. So um, the lakes drain, they induce a 3% um, a change in glacier speed, but only for uh, 14 days, then the glacier kind of re-equilibrates and um, continues to slide, um, accelerating though at uh, the speed that's consistent with the change in driving stress um, as the glacier progressively thins. Um, so this is all just to show that um, the a volume of kind of two cubic kilometers, which it represents kind of the annual um, melt budget of Thwaites, um, only changes the velocity near the lakes um, by parts of um, the glacier's total speed, so only 3% of um, the glacier speed. Uh, so um, this brings up the question kind of what is um, the frick, like what controls basal resistance on Thwaites? And so we can, uh, to interrogate this question, we can use numerical models that use kind of a friction law that relates the shear stress at the bed to um, the sliding velocity UB using this um, um, friction coefficient C and a an, uh, uh, sliding exponent. So we're treating C here, um, the resistance um, as a fitting parameter to the to velocities, which we're going to try and minimize this difference between observed surface velocities and uh, modeled surface velocities, and do this um, iteratively over different um, swath topographies that we have for lower thwaites to understand this convolution of skin drag and form drag and the controls on sliding. Um, so this is a map of two swath topographies that we have for Thwaites Glacier, one in upper thwaites, shown um, in the upper panel here, and then um, lower thwaites. Um, overlaying these topographies are their uh, periodograms of their, uh, of their roughness spectra. So these are using six kilometer windows of the basal topography to map kind of local roughness. And so for both grids, we see kind of this pattern where in one section of the grid where we have lineations, mega scale uh, lineations, for the upper thwaites is the uh, upper section of the upper thwaites grid, and for the lower thwaites, it's the lower section of the lower thwaites grid. These areas are um, less rough. And um, then iteratively, the procedure that we're going to follow is um, using um, Rob Arthur and, um, and Helmar uh, um, uh, Robin inverse method that's as implemented in Elmer Ice. Um, this ingests surface uh, elevation and bed topography information with a surface velocity. Um, uses these to produce these resistive, uh, resistivity fields. So this is the friction coefficient inferred um, from these um, uh, observation data. So we do this iteratively for a bunch of different resolution uh, uh, bed topographies. Um, so here at the left are four of 13 experiments that were run and regularized. So you can see that there's um, one of these is uh, uh, only includes kind of two kilometer scale roughness. The other one um, actually includes kind of 100 uh, meter scale uh, bed roughness. So the roughness along with the grid index here are shown and we correlate um, this metric which is a metric for total roughness which with each of the um, friction coefficient section of the grid and this shows then a correlation plot. So what we find um, this is true with the uh, upper Thwaites grid and the lower Thwaites grid is that as we um, smooth the topography, um, this has a greater effect on the resistance that we infer for the lineations than it does for uh, the roughest sections of the bed. Um, and so these are kind of consistent with uh, laws that would infer um, that uh, the highest frequency component of the bed roughness in the along flow direction is what controls um, the kind of the convolution of the form drag um, into this skin drag, the resistivity parameter. Um, so uh, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna stop there, but um, can ask questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And um, we can roll into our discussion period here. Um, maybe starting with some questions for Andrew based on his talk.
Okay, if no one has questions directly for Andrew, I have a question to start this off, um, mostly to Eliza and Paul. So I'm, forgive me for being a, a dumb paleo person, but your seemingly unrelated models for what controls basal friction, with one being driven by thaw and the other being driven by the hydrology system, do they interact? Are they independent? Are your results compatible? Can you guys discuss that a little bit? So my results, I'm using um, basal friction basically as a proxy for thawing. So I think the, the kind of the idea with mine is that you have these patterns of, you know, regions where the bed is thawed, regions where the bed is very frozen. Related to that, you also have some distribution or friction coefficient that matches in terms of higher and lower. And at this continent scale, this kind of broader pattern um, is useful because you can then use the friction coefficient um, as a way to basically look at the effects of thaw without actually having to deal with the fact that large scale models currently uh, aren't compatible with, you know, looking at this temperature dependent sliding law um, on that scale. And so I think that's more the way to think about that component. And then um, Paul can go into more of his component, but I think looking at Thwaites and kind of examining the hydrology and the role there is more on this, you know, smaller scale, like process-based model, instead of looking at these, of these wider impacts. And so um, I, I would say it's kind of like the process um, and, and modeling approach is a little bit different for those two. Yeah, yeah, I think I agree with what Eliza says on the scale of the issue. Um, in my model, I assume that the entire domain is more or less thawed and able to slide um, or have liquid water present at the bottom. Um, and so I think that my model could be applied to regions once they have thawed, if that's, uh, if research points to that these regions may become, there may be large sections that become thawed and trying to figure out how they might be sliding in the future. Um, but that my work has focused exclusively in regions that are, are already thawed and try and see what might drive a change in basal strength in those regions. Um, so slightly, it's kind of a subset of the area that Eliza's models are looking at. Great, thank you. Uh, if I may speak, I have a question. Uh, well, it's actually for both of you guys and well, Andrew to some extent as well. Uh, but Eliza, I noticed that the, um, I think the temperature field or actually um, places of thawed versus unthawed, um, particularly for Thwaites, um, I've always thought that most of Thwaites bed is thawed uh, already. Actually, Dusty had a paper several years ago uh, on that, and you know he had different degrees of melting at the bottom, but it was pretty much all melting. So, how do you, uh, yeah, digest that information? Or, um, yeah, what about yeah. that observation? So, yeah, yeah, no, I think that's definitely true, and I think that. Thwaites is one of the very challenging glaciers to be able to resolve at the scale needed um, for also simulating the entire ice sheet, which is honestly something that has been a little challenging as I'm setting up um, because I would like to get even higher resolution in those areas. And so I am continuing to adjust like the, the grid, horizontal grid and details with my model to see if I can get that all the way into the thawed right now. It's within a couple degrees of the melting point, but um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a challenge when you're looking at large scale simulations to also be capturing the temperature regime correctly for each glacier. And I don't think that Thwaites is actually uh, just below the melting point. It is, it is thawed. I think, I think that kind of the other component and like more goal of the work is to be looking at these changes in thought and sensitivity. So by, you know, applying a, a change in the friction coefficient that includes the whole Thwaites Glacier catchment, then even though the model might be slightly too cold in that region, it still is uh, 
including the um, effect of it being thawed in, in simulations of, of changes. Oh, I think uh, Luke Zut has a question. Please go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Hi, uh, great set of talks here. You know, one thing it was sort of overarching between these is that uh, y'all are starting to incorporate basically changes in the models. Like things are changing with time, whether it's melting or subglacial hydrology or whatnot. I guess my question is going forward, you know, I, I think it, this is an important step that we start incorporating these things, but how can we actually, you know, predict how those things are going to change? Because that seems to have a big influence on your models. You know, for, for example, Liza, you sort of forced it in different ways and showed that it's really sensitive, but is there a way that we can actually predict how it's going to change? Or do we just have to get the physics spot on to have any chance of that? Like, can we look at paleo records or something to figure that out? Yeah, I think it's definitely an interesting question. And, and um, I, I, yeah, I definitely completely agree with that. Looking at changes in the model is really important. And all of these talks have kind of showed how big of an impact that could really have. Um, and yeah, constraining exactly what the, you know, what the, in my case, mass loss would be from this type of experiment is challenging. The first step that I've taken is doing this some sort of idealized experiment. Down the line, I'm also going to be using radar uh, analysis to constrain that. And so uh, backing out what the basal thermal state is from um, airborne radar surveys for just glacier catchments instead of the whole continent scale. So that's one step that I have in terms of trying to add some more constraints, but um, I think that there's quite a few different directions that need to be included and taken into account to, to really be able to try to figure out what is accurate predictions versus um, kind of exploring all of the, you know, parameter space and possible scenarios. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Eliza and I, I, I just added, I think that some of our models also need to, um, that uh, embracing time dependent data assimilative techniques that can better ingest the, um, the time series that we have for some of these systems. So like elevation records now that extend um, for almost, uh, so for, for decades in, in areas um, and similar like velocity, surface velocity information that can also ingested um, on, on similar like length time scales can help with inferring some of these. So either constraining some of these parameters that are um, convolved with one another, like the friction coefficient um, or exponent and the viscosity. Um, so isolating variables that are difficult to, that are also convolved in this whole problem um, or, uh, or, or using these to infer kind of the time dependence of the systems, the transients of something like the, the effective pressure. So Luke made a point about the importance of tying this to the paleo record. And I think that Ben's talk um, gives us a really important opportunity to kind of discuss um, the initiation of lake conditions and, and how important that, that is. So Ben, do you want to kind of add to this discussion point? Sure, okay. yeah. Thanks for bringing me in. Uh, I think Luke's question was really good. And I think that uh, obviously, uh, one of the hardest things about predicting the future is that all of our models right now are going to tend to be overfit to the current state. And one of the ways to get around that is to kind of look to the past. Uh, and we can look at the ice, or um, in this specific case, we could possibly look at you know sediment below the ice. And like I said in my talk, the South Pole Lake is underlain by a hundred meter sediment column, as shown by the seismic record, and what would be the kind of the holy grail for paleoclimate in this case would be if you know we had like some continuous deposition over millions of years or something that based on what I presented in my talk that seems somewhat unlikely just because the bed is kind of at this like threshold just between uh, thawed and frozen so we probably had long periods of time where uh, the lake was freezing and and then maybe remelting um, so it's hard to say exactly what we could learn from that, but I think that continued investigation and uh, possibly drilling into that lake or some something similar in East Antarctica could reveal a lot about uh, what the ice sheet looked like in past states. 
I know Matt has been thinking a lot about this as well, so maybe he has something to add, but. No, I think you, I think you nailed it, that, you know, untangling this will be hard, but we should be searching the paleo record for places where we can actually start to ask these questions. Uh, it's, it, we can either sit around and wait for these, these to change, these things to change, or we can go back in time to try and recreate the past. And I think the, the latter seems like a better option. Yeah, and I, I think if we use um, the lakes that we have had access to as an analog for some of these bigger lakes with even more sediment, like South Pole Lake, um, we've seen this transition from subglacial deposition to the initiation of subglacial Lake Mercer, at least. So that gives me hope that there's something similar going on um, at South Pole Lake. So I'm, I'm hopeful that in at least some of our careers, we'll be able to access South Pole Lake and, and check those sediments out. Uh, maybe I can um, ask a question sort of going off of um, Luke's question and all of your great answers to his question, which sort of has to do with time dependent um, subglacial processes. And, um, you know, when we talk about non time dependent sliding and sort of exploring that within models, we sort of have the benefit of the fact that most models have implemented the same or similar sliding laws. But in the case of time dependent models of subglacial sliding or subglacial hydrology, there's a lot of difference, right? Whether it's ISSM or PISM or, you know, a lot of the other community models, they have like largely independent implementations of, of very different subglacial hydrology models with different equations. So in the context of like validating models and sort of starting to think about how time dependent changes might happen in the future and um, you know, how that might differ between models. How do we explore sort of not just parameter space, but like model space, right? Like, how do we determine, you know, like the easy answer is an intercomparison project because intercomparison projects like the answer to everything. Um, but, you know, in terms of comparing to observations and sort of thinking about those things, like how do we start to, you know, answer like the question of which subglacial hydrology model is the right one or, you know, the one that reproduces observations the best. Well, my answer would be looking at radar component, which um, is, I think, a useful piece because uh, some large scale um, you know, airborne radar surveys have kind of been able to identify different types of channels underneath. So if you're looking at a, a glacier scale, for example, you might be able to infer some something from that. And I think kind of in terms of uh, this like distribution of basal temperatures, there's hope that you might be able to also use the, the basal temperatures, not just as a constraint for where regions are frozen or thawed, but also kind of this transition zone, which I, I think would be especially useful for kind of pinpointing areas that could be susceptible to change or have, you know, maybe this is just a change in temperature or maybe this is also some sort of signal of a hydrologic change. Um, at least that's a direction that I'm looking to explore and uh, think could have some, some useful constraints in kind of the model um, framework and help with deciding kind of which sliding laws and which parameterization might reflect actually observations and um, and local processes. I think that um, uh, an extension of this question too is um, we have really advanced um, um, subglacial hydrology models but that um, we don't necessarily have um, uh, friction laws that relate changes in effective pressure to changes in um, basal sliding. So there's actually, um, we, we can evolve the effective pressure of these, of the subglacial system, um, but, but um, there actually hasn't been much work done um, on kind of what the uh, form of the sliding law is with this, uh, an, a changing or time evolving effective pressure field, how that changes um, 
this relationship between sliding speed and shear stress is something that I know that other people have are thinking about and investigating, but I think that this is there's a point where the degrees of they're isolating how many degrees of freedom we have in this problem is something I think that uh, there's still a lot of work to do. Can, can I interject here and just ask Andrew if we actually can model effective pressures, subglacial effective pressures? I mean, that's a largely <laughs> unconstrained model that we're working with at this point, right? Yeah, I think that um, what effective pressure, uh, it, it's, uh, I think that we're convolving a lot of information into something that is effective pressure. When we use like real data on these, um, for these like large scale catchments and that isolating kind of what, um, what those mean has not been something that um, I've seen done extremely effectively. When I model the systems of lakes, I get shear stress values that are positive over parts of the lake. Um, that indicate that there might be pinning points over the lake. So even for systems that are relatively simple, where we think that we kind of have a really easy condition to resolve, sometimes like our models are not uh, necessarily, um, our modeling strategy is not always um, consistent with the observations that we have. Well, let alone do we actually have the observations of the effective pressures, right? So that's, that's actually one of the things that uh, Luke Zun and I are uh, trying to tackle. We have a proposal aim, but <laughs> what is the effective pressure? What's a spatial distribution? And I'm trying to tackle that from the observation side. Uh, we could come up with a way to actually pull that information out. That would be great, but we're not quite there yet. I think potentially an opportunity is um, work that uh, I know Rob Arthur is um, doing as well to kind of link acoustic impedance to um, a, a, a independent constraints of effective pressure and subglacial um, uh, bed properties to uh, to kind of infer or see if these match up um, with those inversions that we do. Right, right, yeah. And that's what, um, you know, I do seismics as well. So <laughs> that's what we're trying to do as well, yeah. Um, actually, I, I wonder if TJ, oh, but TJ has actually gone, he's gone, is that right? I wanted to ask him some question. Oh, no, TJ, you're still there. Hello. Yeah, so we talked a lot about the, the basal things and you are actually looking at the internals. So can you weigh in on what you are seeing can reveal about those basal processes that we've been talking about for a while now? Um yeah um i think because i think basically fabric and and ice, ice and isotropy is a reflection of the historical deformation or the cumulative deformation that has happened to the ice that we're observing from the past until now and so i think basically um the fabric is presenting a history of sorts and so you can from the in, in glacial features such that we see through fabric and perhaps may also extend to traditional radio stratigraphic layering um, can be related to basal processes especially those that are more dynamic that would uh, if they had changed through path, past time would be reflected in um, the fabric itself. And so for example, when I showed um, kind of an off center um, bump that I, refer, I, I alluded to may have been a past um, relic of a, of a past geomorphism location, it may have, it would probably maybe reflect um, that there may be some interesting basal conditions below that that may be of um, interest to further look at. I don't know if I answered your question. I had a question kind of building off of that. What's the limitation of unfolding the fabric? Uh, like how, how far back could you look theoretically if you had good data? Uh, we were talking about paleo constraints. And okay, if we're looking at dynamic conditions, we need to look pretty far back. So is radar the answer or? Um, I think it depends on what radar you're using. Um, so basically you, you're, you're the limit of 
how deep you can look and therefore how how much in the past you can look into is determined by the signal to noise ratio of whatever radar system they're using and so for kind of the the data that i presented is with a relatively high frequency so 750 megahertz and so that limits you to what we see is uh, is about 1600 meters so maybe roughly 8,000 to 10,000 years into the past for that region. And so if you want to look at kind of deeper layers and de therefore deeper kind of folds in the fabric, you want to use deeper radar, deeper um, penetrating radar, so radar to lower frequency. But at the same time, um, the polarimetric models also show changes and perhaps um, limitations on the inter the strength of that interference with um, lower frequency and so, so do you lose um, the anisotropy signal well, Is that... you, you detect higher uh, a stronger interference with higher frequencies with, with a higher frequency radar and so um, basically I guess to shortly summarize your question there is a little bit and that limit is kind of maybe a portion of the upper sections of the ice and probably not really the lower section. So we can look at near history, but not super far history at the moment. Hopefully I will change through for the investigation. Cool, thanks. Okay, that was a very lively discussion. I want to thank all of our speakers, um, as well as all of our attendees, especially those on the West Coast who have woken up really early for the start of this. Um, I hope to see all of your faces in other waste sessions throughout the week. Um, thanks everyone for coming and for discussing.